know, the National PKU Alliance uh, funds a variety of different researchers, including myself, which I'm very grateful for. And so today and again on Sunday morning, we'll have uh, some updates from some of the funded researchers. I'll give you a list of everyone that's being funded currently tomorrow morning. Uh, so our first uh, person is uh, someone who's relatively n new to the list, Dr. Robert Nichols from uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And he is going to talk to us about the development of a PKU swine model, which uh, I've been told is not a swine that will be edible for PKU patients, but rather will model PKU. So Dr. Nichols, please, and welcome. Thank you. Um, after having given probably several hundred, um, maybe 500 talks, it's rare that I do something new. But this is a, a totally new experience to me. It's the first time I've ever talked about PKU. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I will tell you about the work we've been doing to try to develop a new animal model to study PKU. Let's see if I can figure this out. So, the quick summary of my presentation, I'll go through the rationale for why we decided to go ahead and generate a pig model. Um, the strategy and optimization of, of gene editing, we use cell culture for that. And then we moved to the animal model and I will uh, present to you the generation of a uh, knockout in the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene in the uh, mini pig to generate a new model for PKU. So why use animal models? Well, one reason is that you need to develop a complete biomedical understanding of the complexity of a disease, um, all the clinical aspects, whether it be neurobehavioral or, or other features. And then a valid animal model allow, serves as a preclinical model to allow testing or, and development of new therapeutic approaches. Um, and that's needed prior to uh, new approaches being, being uh, moved to the human. So why a pig model? Well, mouse models often fail to model the human disease. Um, and in addition, it's hard to see the slides from here. I think I'm going to move around a little bit. Um, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so... <laughs> So mouse models often fail to, to model the human clinical features. The physiology of mouse models, the body size and anatomy is extremely different. And, and that is one of the, the reasons. Um, so we need improved animal models for many disorders. And the pig, pig fulfills this. Um, it has a very similar physiology and anatomy, body size and organ size to the human. It's perhaps the most similar um, out, of, out of different uh, possible animal models. It has a very similar genome. It's more similar to the human than the rodent genome. And the genetic technologies now, thanks to the new technologies of genome editing, are available to use in animals like the pig. And there have been a number of success stories already. And neurobehavioral studies are possible in the pig. And that accurate animal model is essential, as I mentioned, to understand biomedical complexity and develop therapeutic approaches. So the mini pig model is perhaps optimal, as I've mentioned. And the pig you see there on the left, TJ Tabasco, was the first pig to have its genome sequenced, uh, so of the Duroc strain. But there have now since then been a number of other breeds that have had their genome sequenced. So this is a little quiz for you. Um, I've actually labeled the human brain. Um, you see the... the um, uh, Brain on the, brains on the left, and then uh, some slices um, on the right. And the other three species are the rat, pig, and macaque. So macaque, of course, is a primate. So you might expect that to be most similar to human, right, in terms of um, the morphology, the fo folded cerebral cortex, um, and the anatomy. But if you thought that, you'd be wrong. In fact, the brain on the left is the pig. Uh, and it is more similar in size and um, the uh, nature of the folded, uh, the folded cortex to the human than what the rhesus macaque is. 
So um, again, uh, the pig is of the same order of magnitude in terms of size as a human. It's about threefold smaller, whereas the mouse brain is 3,000 times smaller than the human brain, the rat brain 1,000 times smaller. Um, and perhaps most importantly, at the bottom of the slide is the um, um, morphological nature and, and anatomy, which is that the human and pig brain are garencephalic, they have the folded cortex, whereas rodent brains are lysencephalic, they have a smooth brain, there's no folding to the cortex, so they do not have the higher cortical functions um, of um, organisms like human. And the um, pig brain uh, growth and development postnatal is very similar to human. So pig is being used as a model to study uh, brain development and neurobehavioral features. Uh, this is showing a, an image um, from Dr. Rodney Johnson, who has performed magnetic resonance imaging, and the various um, um, sections of the brain are, are labeled here as identified by MRI. And he studied the, the brain development and showed that in the pig, the, the brain undergoes its major maturation and development phases from late in the prenatal stage to early postnatal <clears throat> in a very similar time course to the human, uh, just a, a little bit quicker. Pigs can also be used uh, they're for learning and memory studies. They're very smart animals. Um, so for example, uh, it's been shown that two week old piglets can perform T maze tasks, uh, which assess the hippocampal dependent learning and memory. Uh, interestingly, as you see here, a quote from um, Dr. Johnson, in which he said that the piglets would not perform their tasks if they offered them solid food or even if they offered them regular milk. They would only perform the tasks if they offered them chocolate milk, particularly Nesquik. <laughs> so they're not only intelligent animals, they're picky. They're picky eaters. Okay. Um. And uh, similarly, uh, pigs can be used for behavioral studies. Again, they're very intelligent and they can actually learn to use a mirror to find hidden food. Now, a lot of animals cannot do this, and what it shows is that pigs have an assessment awareness, that is, they can signify um, a situation in relation to themselves. Um, and so, uh, although um, the neurobehavioral studies in the pig are in, in, in really their infancy, um, there's a lot of potential since they are very intelligent animals. And then as a pilot study, uh, to look at the um, biochemical aspects uh, of a potential pig uh, model, we took um, 10 one-month-old Yucatan mini pigs, five male, five female, and Steve Dobrowski in Pittsburgh performed um, plasma amino acid analyses. And what you can see here is that the, the levels in the mini pig on the right are in the same range as the levels in uh, infants, less, a year old or less, um, and the infant data is all from the um, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. So the mini pig has normal plasma amino acid ranges, um, very similar values to the human. And we also looked at cerebrospinal fluid um, and phenylalanine and other amino acid levels were also very similar in range to the human. So biochemically, the pig should be a good model. So this slide shows a number of uh, diseases which have been modeled now successfully in the pig. Um, many of these which are listed, for example, cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, and others are not modeled in the mouse. And, and whereas the pig develops clinical uh, features almost identical to the human disease. And I've added plus PKU to the list because I will show you evidence that we now have um, generated a, a pig model of PKU. So how do we make a pig model? Well, we have this new technology uh, called genome editing, and the uh, easiest, simplest, and uh, most powerful way of doing this is using a technology abbreviated CRISPR-Cas9. And so this is the methodology. How does CRISPR-Cas9 work? Well, for those who don't have a scientific background, this is how it works. We can basically use uh, an enzyme called Cas9 to cut the DNA and generate a mutation that corresponds, um, that will generate a, a disease. 
A uh, quick slide for the scientists in the audience. Um, in practice, Cas9 is a um, RNA um, containing enzyme. The RNA is the uh, chimeric um, uh, that we use uh, experimentally is a chimeric guide RNA um, combining two RNAs, which include a um, region of, of base pairing to the target in the DNA sequence. So it's a 20 nucleotide base. Uh, uh, guide RNA pairing sequence uh, shown in blue, and it requires an additional three nucleotides shown in purple. Well, how do, science, how do geneticists, scientists identify a mutation, a broken gene? Well, this slide shows what is clearly identified as good race cars at, at the Indianapolis Speedway. This slide shows clearly a broken car. <laughs> this is not good. So you can easily see the difference between a good car, bad car, right? Broken car. Well, we do the same uh, for genetics. So the strategy was um, each, um, the phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme, the gene that encodes it is broken into 13 pieces. And we targeted one of those segments, exon 6, um, with guide RNAs that flanked either side, and those are just shown in the, the four nucleotide code. And the CRISPR-Cas9 targets those two sequences and generate is what's called a double-strand break, the DSB or the red arrow. So that's equivalent to those scissors I showed that cut the DNA. And so this RNA binding protein enzyme cuts the DNA at each of those two locations, and that is a bad thing in a cell to have broken DNA. It has to be repaired. And so the DNA repair mechanism often will join the two broken ends together deleting what's in between. So the whole segment of exon 6 will be gone. And when that happens, the protein that's produced from the gene uh, is missing the amino acids encoded by exon 6, and that is a, an inactive protein. So we can see this um, on, a, a, um, on a gel by um, polymerase chain reaction. We amplify the specific DNA sequences from the uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase exon 6 region. The band at top, um, the bright white band, which is labeled WTs, the wild type band, that's the good band, the equivalent to the good car, and the, the um, various uh, deletion breakpoints, the lower, ba the smaller bands, in, and there are four different sizes uh, repeated in each of two cell lines. Those are the, the broken gene, or as shown here, label them with a broken race car. As for deletions, now, when you have two um, breaks in DNA, as well as the DNA repair, being repaired by removing what's in between, you can also take that segment that's in between and reorientate it, so change um, the orientation, which makes a, an inversion. And so I just inverted the word inversions in parentheses there. That's what happens um, at the DNA level. It becomes nonsensical. And these bands... Um, represent detection of specific inversion breakpoints. So again, these are all mutations, so broken uh, genes, or shown depicted by the broken race car. So then, we didn't use all the steps of this slide, but if you go to the middle left of the slide, um, what we then did with um, colleagues in Missouri was injected RNA uh, components for the CRISPR-Cas9 components into the single cell zygote, and then allowed those zygotes to develop for a week in, in culture to for, till they form the blastocyst, so the early pre-implantation embryo, which is the stage that implants um, to, to form the viable pregnancy. So first, to make sure that our, our system, our co optimal components were working um, in the early embryo, we did a screen and isolated DNA and did our polymerase chain reaction, and again, the band at top labeled WT is the good gene, that's the wild type, um, that's intact, and then the lower bands labeled KO for knockout, that's the broken gene, so again, depicted in each case by the broken race car. So the system was working in vivo in pre-implantation embryos, and so now we repeated this step, we ejected the RNA components into the um, single cell zygotes, this time performed embryo transfer into a, zygote, 
into a surrogate mother and then generated litters of pigs. So far we've done five embryo transfers, three we did not get viable pregnancies. The first we got a viable pregnancy but unfortunately did not get any offspring. Um, but the fifth uh, we got a viable pregnancy, monitored it throughout with ultrasound and on July 6th had two piglets born and they were able, it was, it was uh, my collaborators uh, led by Randy Prather in Missouri, it was their 116th uh, project that they're doing and so it's animals one and two. Both were female. Uh, this is after three weeks and one, one, uh, 116 one is the uh, one on the left, it appears larger but in fact that's largely probably mostly due to edema um, in that particular animal. So we wanted to look now and see whether either of these pigs carried the gene deletion in the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene. So first we did a control PCR just to make sure the DNA samples were good and that really bright band you see at top um, is the expected band so all the samples were good. Um, and the, one, the two piglets uh, labeled five and six here. All the others were controls. So in the next gel, we then performed uh, the specific deletion assay, which is looking for, for the mutation. And we did uh, samples in pairs. Um, some DNA samples were diluted, others were, were not. And so in, in those um, lanes numbered five and six, this is the animal 116-2, and you see an upper band there that corresponds to the good gene, so that's the wild type gene. But then also you have a bright band at the bottom that corresponds to the deleted gene, so the broken gene that depicted by the race car. 116-1 was really interesting because we repeated this many times and were not ever able to detect the deletion. So that's lanes three and four. There's just nothing there. So what's going on? So what we conclude is that in 116-1 there is a larger deletion on both alleles, both copies of the chromosome, the one inherited from mum and, and from dad, and we're now currently mapping those breakpoints. Uh, it's, it's quite likely that the um, the mutation is homozygous, so there's two copies of the same mutation, or they could be different, um, but we're, that is ongoing. Whereas the 116.2 is what we term a heterozygote for a, for a normal um, gene and a deletion gene. So the, uh, when um, that animal now is a carrier, so we'll be able to breed her to generate additional animals that are carriers and then breed two carriers together to generate uh, offspring in the future without having to do this whole complicated, expensive, um, fairly low success rates uh, for the embryo transfers. And importantly, what about the biochemistry? Well, 116-1, the blood fee levels were over 2,000 micromolar. The heterozygote had blood levels of 141 micromolar. This was after five days of um, post, uh, after birth, uh, which for the heterozygote, that's in the normal range. So biochemically, the uh, PKU is modeled in, in the pig. Um, now, this is just quickly showing the dietary needs and, and what we might have to do to reduce the fee levels to uh, the level of phenylalanine required for normal development and growth. As you can see on the left, as the pigs um, grow from, from uh, two through 10 kilograms, have a look at their kilocalorie requirement. They eat a lot of food. Um, luckily, your kids don't eat that much food <laughs> because we need a lot of Phoenix one in order to treat these animals' dietary. And as you all know, it's really expensive, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, this is not going to be my direction. Um, our um, um, uh, 
my, uh, my colleagues in, in Pittsburgh, Kristen Skovarek is here in the audience and, and she presented to the Scientific Advisory Board yesterday. She has a poster this afternoon on her mouse work. Uh, she's going to be translating that work into the pig model to develop new and better uh, transplantation approaches. And that work's led by Jerry Buckley in Pittsburgh. Um, I assume many of you may naturally know him. So to conclude, uh, we've developed a pig model of PKU, the little um, female pig at the bottom there, um, but we need more animals. This is one animal, it's a larger deletion, so we need to repeat this to generate a model uh, of PKU that has the expected deletion. We do have a heterozygote, so we can use her for breeding. Uh, the pig model will allow the study of any biomedical basis uh, at the biomedical basis of any clinical aspect of PKU, both in uh, infants, children as they grow, and older, um, in this case, animals. And the uh, pig, uh, pig model can be used to test any therapeutic approach, including hepatocyte transplantation, gene therapy, um, or other approaches, including dietary small molecule, uh, GI approaches, uh, modified bacteria to try to metabolize the phenylalanine, uh, in this case, um, a, a, a large uh, physiologically um, ideal animal model will, will assist uh, clinical translation. Now, uh, this type of approach takes a lot of folks. Uh, this is the, the Pittsburgh team. Um, Megan Yates is, is shown in, in, um, in Dubrovnik uh, where she took holiday. She was an undergraduate student at the University of Pittsburgh who started this project. She did the first studies in cell culture and first demonstrated that we could use CRISPR-Cas9 to get genome editing, and then it was improved by Lena Gurul-Gonzalez in the middle. Um, she really <coughs> uh, brought this to optimization to get ready for the animal studies. Kristen is uh, at, at bottom right. She's really going to uh, take over the transplantation studies. At top uh, in the middle is Jerry Vakley. Um, on the right top is Steve Dobrowski. He ha has done all the biochemistry. And in the middle on the right is Marie Johnson, my research assistant, who's assisted um, all the research studies in my lab. And we also have a team in Missouri led by Dr. Randy Prather, uh, whose photograph is shown there. Um, his team, uh, the actual uh, studies in the animal, were led, was led by Bethany Riedel, who she's also shown. Um, Eric Walters coordinated the entire project in Missouri. Uh, Kevin Wells is a molecular geneticist who um, translated the um, DNA-based uh, um, CRISPR-Cas9 components that we developed to the RNA components for injection. Um, and Sarah Hansen is the veterinarian who's been involved with the animal care. The embryo work, all the embryo work and transfers were done uh, by the three individuals listed, and the pig cares, again, by three individuals listed, particularly Melissa Samuel. And last but not least, we couldn't do this without all of you and the National PKU Alliance uh, because they have funded this pilot work. Thank you.